Hi, my name is Neil Dixon. I am the Assistant Archivist for Stirling Council. And today I'm going to do a wee presentation um, about some of the building plans that we hold as part of Doors Open Day uh, 2020. Now, if you don't know what Doors Open Day is, it is Scotland's largest free festival that celebrates heritage and the built environment. It offers free access to over a thousand venues across the country throughout September every year. Unsurprisingly and unfortunately due to COVID it's not going to take place this year so hopefully this wee presentation kind of gives you a flavour of, of, of some of the buildings in the area and a wee bit of the history behind them. The aim of Doors Open Day is to ensure that Scotland's built heritage whether it's new or old is made accessible to people living and visiting the country uh, on the weekends in September. Now, I'm just going to briefly talk a wee bit about what I do as a job and, and what my role is um, and what the archives does um, as well. So here at Stirling Council Archives, our main task is to acquire, preserve and make accessible the documentary heritage of the Stirling Council area. Anyone can use the service and it is free to access the records for consultation. We are comprised of two professional qualified archivists and one trainee. Our role as a service is, is really important. Uh, we collect archives that are produced by official bodies, societies, individuals, estates, families, schools, um, a lot of other collections and we preserve them. This is because they really are important pieces of evidence about our past. Now the special thing about the records that we hold is that they are unique and require special storage and handling to ensure their survival. The building plans I'm going to show you are a great example of this. Um, if these plans didn't survive, we would lose uh, a great part of our architectural history. Even something simple as a plan really can shed a light on the political, social and economic landscape of the past. So what plans um, will you see today in the presentation? Well, the majority will be from our Stirling Borough Dina Guild Court plans and our Stirling County Council building control plans. Um, if you don't know what a Dina Guild is, basically under Scots law, um, they were a group of borough magistrates. They also had courts set up in the 14th century to settle trade disputes. Uh, but in the 19th century, they became responsible for enforcing the borough's building regulations. Uh, Dinegal courts only existed in Scottish boroughs. So from 1893 to 1975, all building works had to be approved by the Dinegal court in the relevant borough. To create a uniform system, uh, the 1892 Borough Police Act laid down rules for a new generation of Dinegal courts with clearly defined powers. Uh, these standardised Dinegill courts uh, continued to be responsible for building control until their abolition in 1975. Uh, in rural areas, however, new legislation only came in until 1897, and this enforced county councils to introduce building control bylaws. And building control became the, the responsibility of county councils and remained so until 1975. And so when you lodged a plan uh, with either the borough or the county council, um, you, you, it had to be submitted um, by a petition. And when this petition was submitted, it was then put into a register. And this is what you can see on your screen here. So this is the register of plans, uh, the very, very first one uh, for Stirling Borough in 1893. And so on this, First page alone, you really do have some of Stirling's most notable architects. You've got Cluckley and Walker, you've got John Allen, and you've got William Simpson. And um, when these plans start to come in force, uh, it's important to note that not every plan survived. So, for example, the, the, the very, very first plan you can see there is, is for Fourth Street. Um, for a building owned by the Park Brothers and it was for a brush factory. Now, although this is plan number one, a plan was submitted, this plan hasn't survived. The second plan, however, has. And again, 
this again emphasizes why we as an archive are very important. So all the plans that have survived, we hold, preserve and make accessible. And so for the County Council, it was the exact same thing. Here we have the register of plans for the County Council, uh, showing what are the first few that were submitted to them. And what's important to stress is that these Dina Gill plans and the County Council plans really do provide invaluable information about the late 19th and 20th century building activity in Scottish towns and villages. So within the Stirling Borough collection um, here at Stirling Council Archives, there are some very special architectural plans of the Wallace Monument. Uh, recently conserved, uh, the original plans by Thomas Rockhead were cleaned and digitised in 2013. So whilst the Wallace Monument is one of Stirling's most iconic buildings and remains one of Scotland's most popular tourist attractions, uh, the story of its erection is actually beset with controversies. In 1850, a movement developed in Stirling to commemorate William Wallace and build a permanent monument to him. The initial campaign to erect a monument has been credited to a Reverend Charles Roger. Now, Charles Roger was a chaplain of Stirling Castle uh, and he managed to set in motion efforts to raise support and money for a national monument. This led to a design competition, uh, fundraising events and a national meeting in the King's Park on the 24th of June 1856. Abbey Craig was selected as their preferred location for the monument. Uh, this is where many believed Wallace had overseen the Battle of Stirling and it was considered geographically the centre of Scotland. The project, however, was controversial from the start. Many were against the erection of the monument and the project was plagued by financial issues. Unlike other national monuments, the Wallace Monument was funded by contributions from the public rather than by the government. For this reason, fundraising was difficult to the extent that on more than one occasion, it was questionable whether the monument would ever be completed. The design competition was won by John Thomas Rockhead of Glasgow. Uh, relatively unknown at the time, Rockhead had previously won architectural design competitions. Uh, including uh, such building as the Royal Ark in Dundee and St Mary's Free Church in Edinburgh. Arguments, however, arose from the competition. Rockhead's design was deemed to be coloured contrary to the conditions of the competition, leading to a complaint from the Glasgow Architectural Society about the contest. The foundation stone for the monument was laid on the 24th of June 1861 by the Duke of Athol to wide public enthusiasm. Thousands headed to the area to celebrate the occasion uh, with more than 80,000 people arriving at the event. When the monument was finally inaugurated in 1869, after eight years of building work, it was seriously over budget. Rockhead exceeded the cost limit by 5,000 pounds and the contractor, uh, Mr. Harvey of Hamilton, would become bankrupt. The inauguration ceremony was described by the Stirling Observer as a striking contrast to the memorable event when the foundation stone was laid. A formal ceremony was held in the Armory Hall of the Monument. Evening celebrations included the illumination of the monument followed by 30 minutes of fireworks. There was even a new national song composed by William Sinclair titled Yon Tower on the Abbey Craig High. It was specifically composed to be sung on the occasion of the inauguration. Despite the fiasco concerning the monument's construction, the Wallace Monument has inspired many with its views, just like the one you can see here. So publications such as R.S. Shearer and Sons' Panorama, seen from the National Wallace Monument, highlighted the spectacular views from the top, which can still be enjoyed today. Uh, this here is the, the song that was composed, that we mentioned, written by William Sinclair, with the music by George Barker. And again, it's such a, a unique building, the Walsh Monument, that it, it did inspire lots and lots of artists to, to, to create um, new works to kind of celebrate this new appearance in the landscape. Um, the photographs you can see now are glass, place, glass plate negatives. Um, these were taken by Ramsey, uh, a photographer in Bridge of Allen, 
just around about the turn of the century. But again, really highlight the, 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 the kind of striking nature of the Walsh Monument on the building. So we're now going to move on to uh, one of Stirling's most famous architects, and that is John Allen. And in um, our Dina Gill collection for Stirling, we have a number of plans drawn by this architect. And the plans are great because they really do show the variety of styles that Allen was capable of and some of his trademark quirky designs. John Allen wasn't from Stirling, he was actually born in Dunfermline. Uh, in Carnock, sorry, and moved to the Stirling area around 1875. Um, he lived with his sister uh, at Cliff Bank on 32 de Barton Road in a house that he designed himself. Uh, Alan is known for various buildings um, throughout uh, Stirling, uh, notably quite a lot of the villas in the area known as the Sandhole between Cl Clarendon Place and Victoria Place were done by him, and also the villas uh, in Dumbarton Road between the Smith Art Gallery and the Albert Halls. Um, the unfortunate thing is these villas, um, they were completed before the Stirling Dean of Guild plan series began in 1893. And unfortunately we don't have these represented within the collection. We do, however, have some other plans by John Allen in the collection and we'll start to go through those kind of one by one. Now, Alan was a keen antiquarian and amateur archaeologist who was fascinated by symbolism. Um, he wrote several articles for the Stirling Natural History Society and Archaeological Society, in which he outlined some of his beliefs and philosophy. Um, he also served as a town councillor, being elected in November 1894 under the campaign slogan for the candidate who will encourage work. So here are the only plans held at the archives for one of Allen's King Park villas. Uh, this one lies on the corner of Clarendon Place and Park Avenue in Stirling and dates from 1893. And that's just the crown plan for the building. So these houses um, on Albany Crescent were built in 1896 to a controversial design by John Allen. He first submitted these plans to the Guild in March 1896, but did not receive consent to build them until October of that year, after making several changes to the design of the building. Uh, Albany Crescent was demolished in 1965, but has achieved subsequent fame because of the carved stone that John Allen set into the end of the terrace. Uh, this carved stone is now held by the Church of Jesus Christ uh, of the Latter-day Saints at their Missionary Training Centre in Provo, Utah. And on it, it shows a square design of nine carved symbols, each representing a number set in three rows of three. In each row, whether read across, down or diagonally, the sum of the numbers comes to 18. Above this magic square, there is the inscription, What e'er thou art, act will thy part. Now, the building was being constructed in 1897 when a young man called David O. Mackay walked past it uh, deep in thought. Mackay was a missionary from the Mormon church working in Stirling and he was feeling uh, quite sick, uh, quite homesick and downhearted at the time. He saw the motto on the stone and regarded it as a sign that he was doing what he was meant to be. Now, by the time the building was being demolished, Mackay was an elder in the church and remembering how much the stone and its uplifting words had helped him, he brought it and had shipped it back to Utah. The motto is now very famous as is the stone even though the building that housed it is long gone. John Allen also designed, designed this iconic building, uh, the iconic Wolf Craig building in Port Street. With its distinctive Welsh uh, Ruabon brick finish and wolf statue, this building has become a, star, a sterling landmark. The building was originally commissioned uh, by local grocers McFarland and Robertson and was built in 1897. The wolf statue is a reminder of the story of the Stirling wolf, 
whose howls are said to have allowed the town's guard to the stealthy approach of Danish raiders back in the Dark Ages. It and the other incised stones in the building are really typical of John Allen's interest in symbolism and legend. And just to the left and the right of the wolf, you can see his symbols there as well. And again, his signature um, on the side of the building. John Allen also took some design commissions outside of Stirling. Uh, the plans for Dune Borough have an example of his work constructed at Main Street in 1900. Uh, this is a tall tenement building for Daniel McFarlane. It has a stone set into the front upon, what, uh, upon which is carved the inscription, let justice, truth, honour and respect for others' rights be wrought into every part of our empire. And again, in the middle front elevation, you can see there is where the inscription lay. And here we have the ground and attic plans of inside the building. Another commission uh, that John Allen took was for this terrace of shops and flats at Quakerfield in Bannockburn, and they were built in 1901. Again, John Allen's kind of trademark style of writing can also be seen, uh, seen on the building and also his symbolism uh, in the middle, just above the inscription date of 1902. And that's just the ground plan of uh, the building there. So this unusual building lies in Friar Street in Stirling, and built in 1902 for J.B. Richardson. It's built of Welsh ribbon brick, and features a Dutch gable and a large plate glass window. On the facade are six stone panels, two of, which are, two of which are marble and the other four of which are sandstone. Two of the panels are carved with Robertson's initials and the date of the construction. Uh, others have symbols on them that are thought to relate to the Holyrood Kirk in Stirling, of whose congregation Alan was a member of, and also the King's Park where he lived. At the first floor level, the panels carry the mottos, do your duty and honour principle. And that's just the, the ground floor plans of inside uh, the building. And finally, we have this tenement building in Wallace Street, which was built in 1907 for Thomas Ferguson. And again, has his initials carved on a stone panel above the second story window. And finally, that's just the front elevation from inside the building. So located between King Street and Spittle Street in the old town of Stirling is the Athenaeum. And this was built in 1816 on the site of a former meat market. Um, it's a really distinctive building and one you have no doubt seen when walking through the old town of Stirling. Its purpose was to be a merchant's library and also a, a meeting house and it was designed by a, a famous old uh, 18th century um, and late 19th century architect William Sterling who lived from 1772 to 1838. The building uh, comprises of five storeys and has a belfry and a spire and an entrance porch was added at the base of this tower in 1859. Uh, from 1875, the building also served as municipal offices and was made an A-listed building in 1965. Now, the great thing about these plans is that they almost kind of constitute works of art just by the way they look um, and how they're presented. Uh, really, really distinctive and really, really, really lovely indications of what the building was, was going to look like. So as I mentioned, uh, the building was meant to be a merchant's library and here we have a section from one of the reading rooms within it. Here's the ground floor uh, plan for the building uh, with a couple of shops um, to left and right and at the back as well and also the distinctive spiral staircase going um, at the south. On the principal floor we have uh, one of the reading rooms and here's the library floor Again, big space for the library and also two back floors as well. Okay, so we're now going to move on to another building, 
which you might recognize if you if you've been into Starling. This is the toll booth, but not kind of what you you expect. So the new toll booth, uh, which you see, which currently stands today uh, and faces onto Broad Street, was built in 1703 and was extended in 1785. But did you know that between 1806 and 1811, uh, a jail and a courthouse was actually added to the building? Uh, conditions in the jail were actually not great. Uh, the Stirling Local History Society have posted a really interesting online article uh, from the Circuit Court Judge in 1844. And the judge uh, remarks on the conditions of the toll booth. Uh, he states that no doubt there were at one time in some places jails even more wretched than that of Stirling. But that was in some miserable places in the north and before an assessment could have been placed on the counties at large. But there has been no jail, to my knowledge, in which such a fearful state of things has existed as has been, a, as, as has been the case in the prison of Stirling. Um, so what you see here uh, are the plans for the courtroom and some cells to be added uh, between 1805 and 1806. That elevation there on the side, I'll show you a photograph in just a minute, but that, that's kind of the side entrance um, to the toll booth. And here we have a plan showing some of the rooms inside uh, the toll booth. So at the bottom, we've got some council rooms. We've actually got a town clerk's office and here we have the plan of the principal floor uh, which includes the courtroom and a prison for felons so you can distinctly see distinctively see you know, the courtroom on the right hand side and the prisons at the top as well again just uh, some plans showing uh, the courtroom itself and so here's a photograph of the toll booth, and on the right hand side you can see uh, that iconic uh, steeple uh, tower, sorry, but you can also see, uh, if I go back just a second, this section of the building here, this elevation, is what you can see on the right hand side of the toll booth just there. Uh, here we have the plans for another uh, well known local landmark in Stirling, and this is the boathouse uh, in, in Dean Crescent. Um, in Riverside. It was built in 1906 for the Stirling Amateur Boating and Swimming Club and the architect was a Mr A.M. Lupton of 20 Murray Place in Stirling and I think this architect also designed Riverside Primary School uh, shortly after this as well. The boating house is, is still in use today by the Stirling Rowing Club as their clubhouse. Um, I believe it's one of the oldest in Scotland having originally being formed in 1853 and the Stirling UD Boat Club and the Royal Navy also used the boathouse as a base for their training. Now the boathouse you see on these plans is slightly different to the one that stands today. So just above the door um, you can keep, see kind of like a half oval art shape. That was originally meant to depict a boating scene but as we'll see, it has changed into something slightly different. Uh, here we have the, the view you get um, from the river of the boathouse and also some of the rooms inside it with a visitor's room, dressing room, captain's room, etc. Uh, the building itself uh, became an iconic image for, for lots of historic postcards. So again, here we have one depicting um, a classic river scene in Stirling. And again, highlighting boating on the 4th. This is the view um, you did also get uh, just around the corner from the boathouse, looking over to Stirling Castle. And here we have the building as it stands today. So as you can see, it's completely white, um, but instead of having that, that depiction of a, of a boating scene in the door, we now have two blue flags with some red circles in the centre. Uh, and I believe that the initials of the club are on those two blue flags. Okay, so the plans you see on your screen uh, right now are for Stirling's old post office. Um, 
and the plans for the new post office were drawn up by officials at Her Majesty's Office of Works in Edinburgh in May 1893. This new building that you can see was to replace the previous post office building on the same site with a bigger facility. The Royal Mail was a UK-wide service run by central government at this time, so the new post office was not designed by a local architect. The building warrant for construction was granted on the 11th of June 1894. Now, although the postal service in Stirling dates back to the weekly delivery of newsletters and gazettes in the 1660s, Stirling did not have a post office building until around about 1780. Uh, the building used was a thatch house of one storey situated in St Mary's Wind and was run by two sisters by the name of Glass. The entire correspondence of Stirling was held within the office in a series of pigeonholes in a frame 12 inches long by 6 inches deep. The office had a number of homes for the next 100 years, moving in around about 1796 to St John Street, where it remained until 1807. Sorry. The office then moved to Baker Street um, in the premises of William Patterson, who was the postmaster until 1825. This office remained in Baker Street until 1829, when it moved to King Street at number 79. As postal business increased, more space was required, so the office moved to a larger building, also in King Street. And another move for the office uh, happened to go to Murray Place in 1863. In 1869, uh, the coming of the telegraph service to Stirling led to complaints about the cramped nature of the current office and the new premises was purchased in Maxwell Place for £2,000 in 1878. This building was altered to accommodate postal business and opened in 1879. There was continued dissatisfaction about the cramped nature of the premises and it was demolished in 1893 to make way for the building of a proper office designed for the efficient running of the busy modern postal service of the day. And that's what you can see on your screen here. Uh, the building was opened on Friday the 24th of May 1895 with a short ceremony during which Provost Kinross posted the first letter amid cheers to the public and then at 3.30pm opened the front door and dispatched the first telegram. Now what's lovely about these set of plans is that the internal arrangements that you can see here give a clear idea of how the business was transacted in the office, showing the public counter the sorting office and the postmaster's room. Uh, this building remains Stirling's main post office until its closure in May 2008 and I think now it's a, it's a popular bar. So on the screen we have here some really really lovely plans of Allen Park South Church dating from April 1866 and these plans were actually handed into the archives at some point last year and the, the joint and written records of the church that we already hold at the archives as well. So Allen Park Church was created as a separate church in late 1865 when some of the wor worshippers at the Erskine Church split to form their own congregation. The managers of the newly formed church purchased the site beneath the town wall. This patch of ground uh, sold to the church by the patrons of Allen's Hospital was previously known as Busby's Orchard or Gibbs Garden. The architects chosen for the commission uh, were Messrs. Petty and Kinnear of Charlotte Street in Edinburgh. Funds for the building were provided by private donors as well as by subscriptions. Until the new church was built, uh, worship, Bible class and the Sunday school took place in the Union Hall with midweek prayer meetings at the Stirling High School. The new church building was finally completed in 1867 at a cost of £4,893, 8 and 11 pence. This does not include the cost of the north and south stained glass windows, which were gifted by members of the congregation, and the opening service took place on the 20th of October 1867. And so the plans that you can see here are those that were submitted to the church managers by the architects when they were bidding for the commission. So here we see um, 
some plans by probably Scotland's most famous and iconic architect, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. And these plans are for Auchinibert House uh, in Killarne in 1906. So Mackintosh designed Auchinibert House after he was made a partner at the Glasgow Architect Practice of Honeyman and Kepi in 1904. Uh, it was built for F.J. Shand, uh, the manager of Nobles Explosives Company in Glasgow. Uh, the large Tudor style mansion is situated just outside Killarne Village and Mackintosh's distinctive handwriting is visible on some of the plans. And there is also some surviving correspondence to Shand from Mackintosh that confirms that he was the sole designer of this house. Now, Shand initially consulted Mackintosh about the design of his proposed new building in a letter dated the 13th of September 1905 and is held at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. Mackintosh sent a response um, on the 15th with his proposal. Plans were drawn up in the April and May of the following year. The plans were approved by the Western District, the Western District Committee of the County Council on the 20th of June 1906, and it is these plans that are held here at the archives. Work began on the project uh, in September 1906, and the house was completed by the end of 1908. What's interesting is, this, is that this house is perhaps not a typical example of Mackintosh's work. It resembles an English Tudor manor house, and it is likely that the design was uh, very much influenced by the brief given to Mackintosh by the owner. There are some touches that are characteristic of Mackintosh's work, including the moulding over the front door and the wooden balustrade on the landing. It does appear that Mackintosh had some sort of disagree disagreement with Shand and left the project just before completion sometime in 1908. The family had alterations made to the building um, as soon as two years after its completion by another Glasgow architect, David Hislop. And there is a set of plans in existence showing the annotations to the original design by Mackintosh. The house itself remains standing and is a private residence. And again, we'll just flick through uh, some of the plans here. Here's the ground floor plan of the building. Uh, the east elevation. And that's the building as it stands today. Now, Charles Rennie Mackintosh also designed other buildings in the area, including the Bridge of Allen Parish Church Hall in 1854, and also a house up at Mugduck in 1904-1905. Now, the collection of plans held here at the archives, you can also find um, in various other local authority archives, and they really do provide a wonderful built heritage of central Scotland and are a great resource for both private and academic researchers. So if you go to another local authority archive, there's a good chance they will hold a ready Macintosh plan somewhere within their collection. But again, just a small set of plans um, of Bridge Vallon Parish Church, uh, specifically the hall, I should say. And here's the cross section and east elevation of the hall. We're now going to move on to Cowie. And before 1894, Cowie was a very, very small village formed of cottages and farmland. The next 15 years, however, would see Cowie rapidly grow. So from 1894 to 1909, uh, a church, school, bowling green uh, were elected um, along with the formation of a brass band and pipe band in the area. So what was the reason for this? Why this big development? Uh, well, the reason for this was the Alawa Coal Company. They were formed in 1835 and they took over the Bannockburn pit 
from the Caddon Company in 1894 and began to exploit the area for coal. Workers were drafted in from nearby towns and by 1924 the population of the building uh, of the village sorry had reached over 3,000 people. The rise in coal production meant that the Alawa Coal Company had to build more houses for its workers and the first miners rows in Cowie were Murray Row and Mitchell Row. Uh, the Ordnance Survey maps from 1886-1914 really did show the significant increase of property in the village with an additional 10 rows being built within 10 years. Within the Stirling County Council plans, we have some of these miners' rows submitted by the Alawa Coal Company. They date from 1904 and show the size and space of the properties available to the workers. The plans show how one building could accommodate two families. On the ground floor was a kitchen and scullery with a bedroom located on the upper floor. So that's the upper floor plan you can see there with two bedrooms. And on the ground floor plan, again, so for two families, you can see the two kitchens at the back and the two rooms to the down to the either side. Now, the houses built in 1904 were actually an improvement on the previous miners' rows. These rows had amounted to a single room, kitchen, and a shared wash house to accommodate the residents. In most instances, the properties were overcrowded with drainage and water supply, a big problem for the residents. Uh, the lack of space for families meant the disease could spread quickly uh, due to the drainage issues. In 1912, uh, the Central District Committee for Starling noted there were outbreaks of enteric fever in the village due to the absence of proper water um, and also sewage disposal. The miners' rows, however, are fondly remembered by the village. Some properties uh, did have access to their own gardens. A report by the Stirling County Medical Officer, uh, Mr John McVale, on the housing of miners of Stirling and the Bartonshire, noted that two rows in Cowie had direct access to gardens from their house. Uh, the, the pit closed in 1953 and the miners' rows were demolished soon after and the village really does have a different appearance uh, today. But the ones you see on your screen really are one of the iconic images of Kaui in the early 20th century. So here we have um, a plan for Menzies Hall in Fintry in 1908. And on the 9th of October 1908, Fintry public hall open to the public. The building still operates under its current name, Menzies Hall, uh, in dedication to the man who gave it to the village, uh, Sir, Wa Sir Walter Menzies. Sir Walter Menzies was born in 1863 and he had carried on his father's business, uh, James Menzies & Co, Tube Works in Glasgow. Menzies, however, was keen to be a politician and in 1892 made his first steps in running for parliament. He unsuccessfully contested Glasgow Central in 1892 as a Liberal candidate. In 1900, he was again unsuccessful uh, as he contested the marginal seat of South Lanarkshire. Not to be deterred, however, uh, he was successful in 1906 and 1910 by winning the South Lanarkshire seat with comfortable majorities. Although his constituency was for South Lanarkshire, uh, Sir Walter Menzies moved to Fintry in 1901 when he purchased Kilcruyff Castle from G.D. Dunwater. Menzies was a very popular figure in Fintry and he himself had a great affinity for the village. Now, the, the Fintry Parish Council Minutes really do give an insight into how the public hall came to be. On the 9th of November 1907, Menzies had intimated to the council that it was his intention to erect a hall for the use of the inhabitants of Fintry as a memento of his oldest son's coming of age. It was proposed and agreed that the building work uh, that the building would be erected in a few owned by the parish council between the Endrick River and the post office. The architect who designed the public call was Archibald Fleming. 
Little is known about Archibald Fleming, but he worked closely with Walter Menzies on the project. Impressively, Fleming was credited with designing, inspecting and building the hall. The public hall was, be, was, was to be comprised of a large hall, recreation room, reading room, kitchen and committee room, which could also be used as a library. Uh, and the plans for the building were submitted in November 1907 and approved in January 1908. On the 29th of September 1908, a meeting of Fintry Parish Council confirmed that the building was ready to be open to the public on the 9th of October. Before handing the building over to the Parish Council, Walter Menzies recommended that the Council cooperate with the Library Committee in managing it. The opening ceremony was covered in great detail by the Stirling Observer. Uh, just over 320 people attended the event, with Walter Menzies inviting every man, woman and child in the parish, irrespective of creed or politi uh, politics, ages or sex. Although the building was erected as a memento to his son, Walter Menzies also outlined um, other motives for the erection of the building. He noted that Fintry had a declined population of 1,000 people in 1801 to 300 people in 1901. He really hoped that the erection of the public hall could lead to the erection of a railway station in the village, which could also help boost numbers. Uh, Sir Walter Menzies died in London in 1913 with Kilcruyff Castle, passing to his widow and also his son. So we're now going to move on to uh, Dunearn House in Loch Ernhead. And this house has quite an interesting history, uh, not necessarily because of the building itself, but because of the people who lived in it. So in 1935, uh, Mrs. Margaret Greenlees Margaret Kerr and Vera Holm submitted an application to alter the Dern House at Loch Ernhead. At this time, uh, these three ladies were residing at Tiena Creek in Loch Ernhead. They renamed uh, the house uh, Alt Greenach, and this uh, in Gaelic translates as Sunny Burn, which likely refers to the Ogle Burn, which borders the end of the garden. Uh, the two-storey house was extended to include a maid's room, uh, a workroom and two bedrooms plus the addition of a garage and the drawings were produced by Perth architect William McIntyre. Now these three ladies of Loch Ernhead were anything but retiring spinsters. Prior to settling in Loch Ernhead they had all been active as suffragettes and worked with the Scottish Women's Hospitals, the, the SWH, in Serbia during the First World War. So let's just explore uh, the lives of these three individuals just a wee bit to kind of show this, the significance of, of, of why this house is important. Well, Vera Louise Holm, also known as Jack, was an actress who often played male roles. She joined uh, the Women's Social and Political Union in 1908 and the following year became the chauffeur for Miss Pankhurst. During the First World War, she enlisted in the transport unit of the SWH, serving in Serbia and Russia. She also toured Scotland, giving lectures, uh, promoting the work of the SWH. I think we have a picture. Yeah, here's a picture uh, of Vera being the chauffeur to Miss Pankhurst. Uh, Margaret Campbell Greenlees uh, and Vera or were also both active members of the Women's Ruler Institute in Loch Ernhead. We hold uh, the group's minutes, uh, which can be viewed in the archive search room, and Vera's signature is frequently found in the minute books for the meetings she chaired. Many of the meetings were hosted by Margaret and Vera in their home. Margaret Kerr was the daughter of Dr Alice Kerr, who was also active in the suffragette movement. Margaret was involved in military activity, setting fire to Little Box. Um, this resulted in her being charged with arson and imprisoned for three months in 1912. Years later, while serving Loch Ernhead, it appears she may have helped run the local coffee house and hall for a period. And again, just showing you the, 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 the interesting stories of the people 
who lived inside these houses. On Sunday the 13th of November 1927, Our Lady and St Ninian Church opened in Bannockburn. Uh, the building took two years to construct, with the original plans being approved on the 17th of April 1925 by Thomas Lupton, uh, who was the Stirling County Council Central District Clerk. The architect of the church was Archibald Macpherson. Born in 1851, Macpherson crafted the plans for the church shortly before his death. Macpherson was born in Edinburgh and practiced in the city for all of his career. The majority of his work, however, concerned the design or alterations to Roman Catholic churches in Scotland. Our Lady and St Ninian Church would be one of Macpherson's last designs. The plans were drawn in 1925 and Macpherson died two years later on Christmas Day in 1927, shortly after the church had opened. The church cost £8,000 to build and was described in the Stirling Observer as being uh, of free Gothic style and cruciform design. The church could accommodate 700 people and the interior was constructed of granite grey brick with a vaulted roof um, of pine wood. The church also had a connection with the Murray uh, of Pulmay's family. The high altar and seats were donated by John Murray, who then, who then resided in London. Several local trades were also involved in the construction of the church. Uh, we do have a photograph in our collection showing the names and details of those involved, and that's the photograph there. Uh, the church was blessed and opened by Reverend Dr. Henry G. Graham, um, Bishop of Auxiliary of the Diocese of Edinburgh. We're now going to move on and focus on another architect, and that architect is Edith Burnett Hughes. Now, Edith was the, the first practicing female architect in Britain. And here at Stirling Council Archives, we hold a collection of a number of her plans. In 1914, Edith graduated from the architecture course at Grace School of Art in Aberdeen. And for the next few years, she lectured at Grace and also assisted at Jenkins and Mars and W.J. Devlin's practices. In 1918, she married Thomas Harold Hughes, her former tutor and fellow architect. By 1919, Hughes had become a partner in John Burnett and Sons office in Glasgow. However, she left the partnership the following year and was unable to move to London office. This was because they had no separate toilet for females. And instead, Hughes set up her own practice in Glasgow in 1920. She also started a family in the 1920s, having three daughters. This was, of course, before the time of paternity leave, and as the plans show, um, she did continue to work throughout this period. And it's interesting to note, uh, for the three sets of plans that we hold, all were for female clients. The work on high mains that we're going to show you uh, was for Jessica Beard-Smith, one of Glasgow's first female councillors. Now, as mentioned, we hold some of the drawings for the following properties, but for the Stirling area, Hughes was also involved in the restoration of the Clement Chapel at Dumbling Cathedral and alterations to Beacon School, uh, formerly Beaconhurst, which is now Fairmont, I think. So this uh, property that you see here is Bonhard, uh, near Aberfoyle, and this was done in 1929. Built in 1932, this four bedroom cottage is notable for its unusual shape. And as mentioned, the, the plan was done in 1929 when Hughes was based at 121 Douglas Street in Glasgow. Uh, this plan is for Deals Craig House in Craig End, which is near Strathblane. And this was done in 1925. 
what's quite interesting is that Hughes's name is not on any of the drawings that we hold. It just usually states Architect Glasgow. But the the Dictionary of Scottish Architects does list that she was involved uh, with with this plan. Now, what's interesting about this plan is that it includes a garage, which at the time would have still been relatively new uh, for a for a home at this time. Uh, it was only the 1920s, and the middle classes had only started to afford cars. This plan, dated from 1947, um, is, for far, is for high mains um, at Buchanan Castle grounds, and Hughes was asked to design a kitchenette to add to the north wing, and this would allow this section of the 19th century house to be let as an additional, an additional cottage. Here we have um, Edith's um, signature, and also her obituary that appeared in the local newspaper. Uh, so that was the talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Obviously, I can't go through every plan that we hold in the archive, but we do hold a great, great selection. Um, our details are on the screen there if you're wanting to get in contact with us. But uh, please note that um, we're at the time of this talk, we're currently not open to the public. Uh, we hope to be soon. So please phone or email us if you're if you're wanting to come down and access our collections. But thank you very much. I um, hope you enjoyed that and hope to see you again soon.